Welcome to the show. We're live, by the way. Woo! It's time for a good Oh. If you want to invite your friends, we're live on YouTube. Go to Winning by Design on YouTube, and this goes live. It's streaming right now. Put it on Slack if you want. because they take too long anyway. So the song that you just saw, as I mentioned to a few of you, that song is available on the YouTube channel right now. It's made by DJ Back for you. It's the fastest growing female DJ of, uh, and from Europe. Uh, you should check her out, DJ Back. Back stands for Rebecca. She's gonna be popular. She's actually on her way to Guatemala City right now to play in Guatemala City. She created this song and it was done because when I was at RD Summit in 2018, like the last one, right? I was so motivated by how people responded to the music. It was not what I did, it was just like I put up cool music and everybody was like, ah, okay. So we created this song for you, so that's available. Um, this event right now, as I said to several of you, is live. So we are broadcasting. So if you go to winningbydesign.com, sorry, if you go to YouTube, click Winning by Design, as soon as you click on the channel, you already see that everything is live and that you right now are being streamed. Okay. <laughs> yeah. The second one, oh, she's already there. We're going to turn around. Do we need to start now? Yes, we yeah. started. <laughs> started. You have already started, Manazinho. Exactly. <laughs> What does I uh, admit, uh, admit to with this t-shirt? Oh, it's a long explanation. Maybe well, someone here can explain. <laughs> we need somebody from here to explain. What is Manazinho? Uh, it's a uh, born in Florida, that's why I gave it to you. Who was born here? Oh, so now you know my nickname is Indo Jaco, I-N-D-O-J-A-C-C-O. And that is to show the heritage to my wife's family, which is Indonesian. 
And in Indonesia, when you're half Dutch, when you're born as a Dutch person in Indonesia, you, uh, you get the Indo title. But I wasn't born there, but my kids are born. So th- anyway, so I kind of like claim it. <laughs> Indo title. He has so many interesting stories. Wait and see. No, go ahead. Go ahead. If no, you want to do the introduction. We have one microphone, so we're going to share. <laughs> we we get two, but I'm not giving up mine. <laughs> <laughs> we have to behave. Awesome. So, guys, uh, I'm switching to Portuguese to explain to the guys. Uh, o, o Jaco se sente mais confortável se a gente falar em português do que se a gente falar 100% do Hangout em inglês. Então, é, primeiro, obrigado por, por todos estarem aqui. É um momento, um prazer enorme para todos nós né, receber o Jaco, a Renata e o time da Winning by Design. É, e a ideia desse Hangout é explicar um pouco para todo mundo o que é esse projeto que a gente está fazendo o kickoff essa semana. Né, isso não é uma ação que a gente vai é, fez essa semana e acabou, foi embora, o que, que vai acontecer? Não, isso é um projeto que pelos próximos cinco anos a gente quer ver ele perpetuado aqui dentro. Então como é que a gente vai habilitar todas as máquinas para que isso continue acontecendo aqui? Né, mas antes de mais nada, acho bacana a Rê se apresentar, né? Deixa eu passar para ela. <risos> The hero. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bom dia, pessoal. É, muitos de vocês eu já conheço, é um prazer enorme para mim, para o Iaco, para o time. Pessoal, levanta a mão só para a gente poder ver vocês, Clarissa, Paula e Tiago. Uma salva de palmas para eles, por favor. Então, nós somos o time é, que vai, vai assumir esse projeto no Brasil. Uh, o Iaco começou o projeto aqui com a gente uh, e agora nós vamos tocar esse projeto junto com vocês, a várias mãos para que a gente, para que esse projeto tenha a cara de vocês. No dia a dia, o que a gente quer fazer é ajudá-los a chegar onde vocês quiserem. Esse é um projeto onde a Resultados Digitais está investindo em vocês para que vocês tenham um começo do que vai ser o resto da vida de vocês. E vocês vão carregar, eu tenho 20 anos de experiência, um pouquinho mais, de experiência em vendas, é, e quando eu fiz o primeiro treinamento de Winning by Design, foi, me, me mudou. Foi um negócio assim, foi muito forte e eu falei, eu quero trazer essa empresa para o Brasil. Então, nós estamos aqui hoje para trazer isso para vocês, essa transformação necessária, que eu tenho certeza que daqui 20 anos vocês vão falar, eu lembro daquela conversa lá atrás que a gente teve com o pessoal da Uniba Design. É isso que a gente quer trazer para vocês e é isso que a, o, a, a Resultado Digital está trazendo para vocês, para que vocês mudem a vida de vocês, para vocês serem o que vocês quiserem. Uhul! I'm just clapping. I don't know what I'm clapping for. I'm just clapping. It's tone of voice. Oh, tone of voice. Okay, I love it. Like for, for now, only introductions. And she said something very special about you, but we are not going to share now. <laughs> <laughs> Só queria fazer um ponto aqui que eu fiquei pensando. Ah, o pessoal de vendas conhece melhor o Jaco, né? Porque por princípio, né? Já fizemos vários treinamentos, usamos a metodologia. Uh, e os outros times um pouco menos. E, e hoje, uh, I'll just switch to English so that you can understand this part. So, so here we have uh, not only sales guys, right? Uh, we have also, and girls. Uh, we have also CS and product, and I mean, RD uh, is here. Uh, so maybe the very first question is, why is, what's the meaning of this project for you? And why is it important for us? To have you here. What's the meaning of this project for me? So, oh, a, a couple of things. I want you to understand that trade of sales has no school. There's none. You don't go to school to be trained. Yet, the trade of sales will offer you an incredible opportunity to provide for your family. With sales, we can open and give people all around the world that do not have a very good opportunistic job, such as people that drive Ubers and work at Starbucks, you pretty much have a reasonable, if you come out of college, you have a reasonable position on how to make some money up to like a certain dollar figure. But once you go beyond that, it's really hard to find a job. What I found and what I found in, over the years uh, that I worked is like that sales actually is a super cool job to have. You come out of school, uh, you know, like a first, second, third job, it actually gives you the opportunity to, to travel to a trade shows occasionally, to work with customers, uh, to learn the product, but it never gets the credit for that. Now the world has changed. 
the world has shifted radically. We see more modern uh, things happening. And now what I look at is like, sales is no longer a job that is being performed by 45, 55 year old people. It is performed by people in their mid twenties all the way up to their mid thirties. It has become a new job. Most of the world has not realized that yet. But in Brazil we have. And so suddenly what you see, and even if I see it at, uh, at RD Summit, what I see is that people embrace it and it doesn't have to be boring and we can play dance music in it and we can drink Red Bull and it is all okay. We don't have to be formal and we have suit and a tie. As long as you can help your customers and you're good at what you do, there's a role in sales for you. That I found that you folks all you know, here at RD completely embraced. Second thing is, it's not about the money. A lot of people think that sales is about the money. Money is what follows if you do a job of passion, and if you enjoy what you're doing, then the money will follow. And sales, it's really common that that happens. Now, may I make clear, sales is not just the people who are providing and signing purchase orders or helping purchase orders being signed. Sales to me is every person who works with a customer. Customer success, account managers, marketing, it's everybody, you're either creating product, you're in engineering for example, or you're selling product, marketing, sales, and customer success. So for me, all that is accessible to everyone right now. And only few companies grab that and understand that as well as RD does. In a more foundational level, right? Yes. Uh, Jaco, uh, you always mention that RD is special for you. Mm. Why is that? Uh, first of all, I'm allowed to drink Red Bull, and I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> they serve it in plentiful down here. But I think that what I find is that I'm a passionate person, um, and the passion that I have for sales, you, you mirror that. So it's not just me being passionate and sitting in front of people go like, what is this guy on Red Bull doing? You actually you know, and enable me, go, no, go faster, go dance, go crazy. We are not tired. We're not tired, <laughs> let's go, go, go. <laughs> and so I find that my passion and energy is matched with your passion and energy. Now, I believe that is not a surprise to me, I believe that, you know, if I look back to the soccer relationship that our countries have, but I also believe that your age and, and the nature of your lifestyle matches very much where I believe sales will be going into the future. And when I, move, when I say with that, it's like, look, I move, sales will move out of the boardroom as an ex just as an executive task. Still be there, but there's this entire new generation. And you embrace that. That's why I love you guys. Love it. So now I have a hard question to go Renata. for it. Hey, how are you gonna implement this to us? <laughs> Can you explain us about the project? What's going In on? Portuguese. Deliverables. Yes. Yeah. Então, pessoal, esse, esse é um projeto que a gente está fazendo de enablement, ou seja, de treinamento com toda a RD, né? Os RDs junto com channels. Então, como é que a gente vai implementar isso? A gente tem uh, uma série de vídeos que a gente vai uh, programar com vocês. A gente vai filmar isso e vai ter a cara da RD. Além disso, a gente vai ter os blueprints, que nada mais são do que fr uh, frameworks, que são os esquemas de como a gente pode chegar onde a gente quer. Porque vendas né, e como a gente conversa com o nosso cliente, não é simplesmente eu começo a falar e eu vou andando, sei lá onde eu vou dar. A verdade é que a gente, se a gente tiver um caminho, que a gente sabe de onde a gente está partindo, para onde a gente quer chegar, a gente consegue isso de uma forma muito melhor. E a gente consegue uma série de shortcuts, ou seja, atalhos, que vocês não vão demorar nenhum tempo para vocês chegarem onde vocês querem. Então a ideia é que vocês tenham isso na mão de vocês e que vocês possam implementar isso junto com os clientes de vocês, certo? Primeira parte. Segunda parte, a gente vai filmar vocês fazendo isso depois. Então não é a nossa cara que vai aparecer, a gente vai ajudar vocês a vocês mesmos implementarem isso dentro do cliente de vocês. Vocês vão ser as estrelas de tudo que a gente está fazendo. Essa é a ideia principal do projeto. Para depois disso, a RD poder ser o próximo unicórnio brasileiro. É aí que a gente quer chegar ou não? It's kind of a weird question, but I think it's very uh, uh, provides important clarification on how do you guys work together? So how do you participate in the project versus the local team? I do nothing. Nothing get all the money. She does everything. Get nothing. <laughs> hey, so next question. Yeah. So there's a couple of things that I want you to find very important in, in what we do. 
And this is when, when, uh, when we worked with Eric very early on, I showed him the contract that Renata and I have. And there's something very important in that contract. When we win a contract like this, Renata gets how much percent do you get to keep of this contract? 80%. 80%. So if this contract, and I'm just using a round figure, it's not the right figure, it's a round figure. If the contract comes in at 100,000 reais, Renata gets to keep 80,000 reais. That means that those 80,000 reais do not go out of the country back to America, where we invest in all kinds of other companies in order to deliver. It stays inside the country. Then what Renata has to do, she has to hire people and bring on the best people to coach you. We believe very much in that model because what it allows her, it allows her to put the money that she's earned from your account back into your account with people who are speaking Portuguese, training in Portuguese, and knowing your local culture. That is not how most firms work. Most firms take all the money, then pay Renata, which would end up being 10, 20% of that dollar figure. Make sense? But then we have to hire the people. Now she's in charge of this project. You have to understand, at this point in time, after the contract is signed, I work for her. She pays for me to come here, and she tells me, be here, do this, which she does very well, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and then he does that too. Everybody says, yeah, like, Jaco, be here. But she does that. So she runs this entire project. That makes it way better for you, because you don't have to come back to me to ask me. She's fully skilled, capable, hires people, trains people herself. That makes it more valuable to you. Now, what Renata does for that remaining 20%, I do all the architecture and design. I approve everything, I look at everything, make sure that everything is top notch, that the quality is right. One of those things is that we're gonna shoot videos of you. So Renata, Laura will create a, a video that says, here's how we're gonna do it. Then Renata and team will create videos of you actually performing it. We do that for a reason. We know that you learn better from your peers than you learn just from a teacher. So if you put two of you in front and role play in front of a camera, then everybody else goes like, ah, that, that, I can do that too. That's why we put you in front of that camera. No, we're not gonna pay you. Renata is not gonna pay you. <laughs> <Don't have> <laughs> <laughs> okay, but that is how we work. So essentially, I, in this case, after the contract is signed, which has happened, I work for Renata and she tells me when I need to be here and to do what. And we are very happy to have you all here, so <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Um, we as a, I would say as a culture, uh, it's part of our DNA already that we compare ourselves with the best, always. Uh, we have a very high bar. Uh, it's actually very good when we, we always say this, that we go to these very fancy conferences and uh, we return with few insights. So this is the goal, <laughs> so that uh, it's actually uh, reassuring that we are on the right path. Uh, at the same time, we are very open to learning uh, and again, to continually evolving. <coughs> All this to ask, how do you, uh, with so much experience that you have in the Valley you know, uh, area, CRD and maybe how you compare us with the companies that you have been working with? Yeah, I can compare, but I, I think that for me, it's important to realize that within a year, companies will come from the valley here to see what you're doing here. The world is reversing. And the reason what we are dealing with in today's world is that the generation, you folks, are the one that power a company like this. Most of the companies have a hard trouble finding out how to leverage the best that you can offer. We call it productivity. They have a hard time making you productive because their model, as I explained in the past, comes from working harder. When I was raised, I was raised on working harder. And when I was working harder, I had to do more homework. If I was playing chess, people said, play more, make more chess moves. When I was in sports, more push-ups. They always wanted me to work harder. And so in a lot of the world, a lot of managers are primarily focused on working harder. Your generation, the younger generation, is not focused on working harder. Their role is, I want to work smarter. And so what we see what the rest of the world is struggling with, how can a manager who was taught to work harder manage a group of people that was taught to work smarter? 
that friction is what we're solving as a group together here. And what I find so amazing by, by, by Resultatus Digitae is that from Eric and Jew and Rodrigo, all of you embrace that. And it's not like Rodrigo needs to know it because he's the boss. No, Rodrigo says, I don't know. You tell me what you want to do. What do you guys want to do? Uh, now, as soon as you tell him what to do, he will ensure that it happens. He has that power and that, 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 that say. But he will give you the voice back. What do you want to do? That is pretty unique. And so I believe that what we're going to find here and what you're going to find working for Resultatus Digitae. Look, some of you may think you're going to be eternally ha uh, wealthy from this. You're going to buy houses and live a rich lifestyle. I want to let you know it's unlikely. It's unlikely that that amount of wealth will find all its way back into your hands, like buying a house kind of wealth. Don't get me wrong, you will make money out of this. But for you to come here and say, I'm going to become like make millions of dollars, unlikely. But that's not what you're here for. Because you're sometimes so focused on that money, you do not see actually what you do get when you're part of this. You're part of one of the first companies in the world, the first, that is learning how to embrace the culture from the old, being the people who know, and the culture from the young, being able to work smart. You're the ones who's learning how to combine that. And by combining that, I guarantee you, many of you will become vice presidents and leaders two, three companies from now, five years from now, you will be the leader saying things that I sing from what you learned during the next year because you're the first in the world who's embracing this and moving forward, one among the first. Now, we have learned from other companies like Google and an Adobe, they too have gone through this. And it is a wonderful experience for as much as the managers, as the people, everybody's in the same boat. Yeah. We're all trying to, to figure out together. They don't know it 100%, right? We know a little bit more than they know, and you know, you hope that they know a little bit more than you know. So it's all together. That is what I find so amazing about RD. But I don't think that a year from now, you should have to look or compare yourself against other companies and say like, oh, they're better. I think a year from now, with the group and the program that we're putting in place, other companies are gonna come here and learn like, what happens at this company, right? And I think that that is you know, why I'm so enthralled or enjoy so much working with you folks. Yay, <laughs> good, very good, thank you. <laughs> when you do that, is that signaling that they clap? Yeah, somehow, <laughs> you know, to get some. Okay. Am I, am I, no, am no, I, they am can. I, am I forcing the applause? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm not forcing the Yeah, like I. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, I, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, no. Okay, so, uh, Jaco, you, you have been working with, um, in, in Silicon Valley for many years, and uh, how do you compare uh, our company with the other top SaaS companies in the world? Okay, so companies in general are coming from a call. The, the, you know, there's things that you can do in a company, and so I'm going to talk about two things. You can't train people on culture, and you cannot hire people who, um, who do not have the right culture. So if you hire people with the wrong culture inside the company, then in generally they propagate, that bad culture propagates very quickly. Um, so culture is extremely important. Like it is like the core of it. And as a saying, I think it comes from the Valley, you know, people can look it up where it comes from. It's like um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. If you do not have the right culture, you can have all the strategy you want, it won't happen. So if you have the right culture, now what I see a lot of companies have, and I want to call this out, is the cool coffee machine culture. Like look, you have a pretty cool workspace, right? And what a lot of companies do with that culture is like, they essentially paid you in coffee beans and ping pong tables and cool slides, which you all have, and they go like, come work for us. We're gonna pay you half the money that we pay everybody else, but we're such a cool company, come work for us. So for the past decade, what many companies tried is try to bribe younger people to come. The problem is not that they give you the coffee machine and the cool workspace. The problem was that they made it at the cost of something. And the cost was they were not investing in you. They took that money and assigned it to the profits of the company and said like, okay, instead of paying them a thousand dollar extra, we pay $500 in the coffee machine, we stick the $500 of profit into our pocket. That was the problem. The cool coffee machine we still all want. 
And the slide is pretty cool, although I see nobody going off the slide, mind you. I keep a close eye on it. Nobody has gone off that slide. <laughs> okay. But what we need to do as a culture, if we put the coffee machine in and we say we, it's a sign of investing in you, then let's invest in you. And what I mean with that, let's invest in you in your career to the point that you most likely will benefit at it at the next company you work from. Do we have the guts as RD and Winning by Design to train you knowing full well that at any point in time you can take the training and try to get $10,000 across the street more? That can happen. We believe that if we train and we show that as a group that we invest in you, that the right people will stay and the right people will go. And that is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. That's all okay. But investing in people cannot be held back because we're afraid of what will happen if we do invest them, right? And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to invest back in you, knowing full well, 100%, this could completely backfire. But we know if we do not train you and we do not invest you, we know for sure it will backfire, mm -hmm. right? So it's a very self-serving decision. I get that, but you are the benefactor of that. You are going to get proper training, not like the ones that you see on a, on a video somewhere, oh, here's how you write a cool email. We have that too, but a proper training. And the training is so good that many people of you will steal the, the, the book. We know, you take pictures, we know all that. And the next company you go to, you go like, <laughs> I'm gonna teach what I was taught. And for me, that's okay. I don't mind that. I mean, licensing wise, I mind that, but I don't mind that because you are teaching the next person with the same passion that I have. And that allows us to make all the next generation even better and better. For me, that you're investing culturally and making investment in the people part of your culture, that is the reason why, why I think this company is going to succeed, why I think other companies from the Valley will come here and from other parts in the world. Awesome. Nice, man. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can! <laughs> <laughs> you did it, right? Okay, that was see, that's authentic. Nice. <laughs> oh, and you can. By the way, you can also hooter and holler, right? Okay, let's practice that for a round. Can we just hooter and holler and give a loud clap? Woo woo woo! Come on! Yeah! Oh, yeah. Boom! That's okay. Just practice. Nice. Sure. <laughs> É, só para ficar bem claro, muita gente aqui vai falar talvez isso não seja para mim, não sou vendedor, né? Não quero ser vendedor, não é essa minha praia. Mas o que a gente está querendo mostrar para vocês é que assim, quem não quer ser vendedor é ok. E o que a gente está tentando propor para vocês é que vendas também é um skill que a gente pode praticar no dia a dia é, não sendo vendedor. Porque de verdade o que a gente está tentando ensinar para vocês ou ajudar vocês a ficar mais claro é como educar o meu cliente, porque lá na frente você não vai precisar vender nada para ele. Ele vai pedir para você, para você dar para ele aquela melhor solução, porque ele viu o impacto, ele viu o valor e é isso que ele quer para ele para o dia a dia. Então, no final das contas, todo mundo ganha, porque a gente não está só ensinando os vendedores. A gente está mostrando para vocês como dar impacto, como mostrar valor para a pessoa que está na ponta. Eles vão querer estar com a RB, eles vão querer estar com vocês, porque vocês vão dar valor, impacto e vão mostrar para eles como eles vão ganhar mais dinheiro. Yeah. É isso. Uh, what, what did you just say? In short? The, the, uh, the, uh, the importance of sales as a skill. That's right. Thank you for doing that. And, and actually, uh, I'll, I'll just kind of summarize in English, but uh, with one point that uh, Erica from CS brought up, uh, which is, uh, this is a training not on sales discipline, but on a sales skill that is important for everyone. So this is our real focus. Yeah, and for me, you know, like, like think of a job, think of you would be, in a, if you would be a doctor. As a doctor or as a nurse, you can go home at the end of the day, you go like, look, you make people better. Maybe as a doctor, you can't save them all, but you actually go home and you feel good. Like, it's not like you sold guns to someone or you sold cigarettes to someone, right? Mm -hmm. You actually, a doctor is a very honorable job. Sales, what we're uh, sending to you, is also a very honorable job. From the moment I started doing this early on, I realized that if I keep helping my customers, that's an honorable job. Even if it's not always in the best interest of the company. 
by helping your customer, it is always in the best interest of the, of the company, right? And so you go home and you go like, look, I may not hit my goal of 20 SQLs a week, a month, whatever it is. I may not have hit my goal on onboarding 15 clients. I get that. Did I help the customer today? Yes. And so it's a very honorable job, but we've never allowed it to be that job. We always felt that sales was hard nose negotiation tactics, twisting customers' arms, making them do something, manipulating them. It's not. That is the honorable thing that we're trying to teach you in, in what we're going over the next weeks. What we're doing in the next you, weeks. You may also want to explain why they have to be uh, good kissers. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> What we find and what the challenge is that when most sales professionals come to us, that what most salespeople want is they want to have these advanced sales skills. Can you teach me the most advanced, challenger, provocative sales technique that I can use? And although that is important at some point in time in your career, what nobody does is teach you the fundamentals on an excellent level. What we're trying to do is giving everybody training to become an amateur at expert level. And we go like, no, be an expert at the fundamentals. I can show you clip after clip after clip of every professional in the world, whether it's sports, doctors, everyone, and they all tell you the same thing. The expertise comes from being an absolute expert in the fundamentals of the job, not of the advanced notices. The advanced things can be taught and come naturally. And so what many will, <coughs> will find, it's like, Jocko, but that's such a fundamental skill. And I go like, okay, let's role play. And I go like, oh, it's not that fundamental after all, right? No. And so to become an expert in the fundamentals is what makes you an expert in your job. By doing this, we enable you to have a career. The problem is, that if you're not an expert in what you're doing, you later on can, you're just becoming one of all the others that do the same thing. So you never will stand out. But becoming an expert in the very basic fundamentals of sales, you become really good. From there, we can do anything we want. That level of fundamentals is what we teach you. And it's looking, it's gonna be very sexy when you're gonna be taught. We're gonna have a lot of fun doing videos. You're gonna struggle, you're gonna, you're gonna figure it out, you're gonna go like, now I know what he's talking about. For us, that gives you a career well beyond this company. And when you trust us in that, and you're like, no, I'm gonna have that career, then you feel like, hmm. Now, what a problem that these companies like these are having is they have generally a problem with retention of people. It's a very open topic that we've talked about, like, but people are leaving. And then they say, mm, millennials are leaving. And as you may know, the moment in time that we refer to you as millennials, we're probably gonna insult you pretty soon thereafter, right? It's not a good term. And so when we say millennials are leaving and they're not staying in the job, it comes from a particular place. Where does that insecurity come from? Because from the following, if I tell you this company is gonna grow fast, you're going to make money on the backs of it. And if I tell you, we have a cool coffee machine. If I tell you all these things, then what you come is you're going to come for the money and the coffee machine. And so when then you get a job across the street that has an equally cool coffee machine and pays you a little bit of money, you leave. That's normal. That's why we attracted you. We need to think we're not here for the money and the coffee machine. They are enablers. We want to make sure we get paid. We're here to learn how to change something to learn how you go from like, hey, being a very cool, great company to being the number one leader in the industry. Now, when I looked at Eric and when I sit with him yesterday, <clears throat> I say stuff like, that dude may, may end up one day president of this country, right? Like, like I said this to them, like, dude, like, it wouldn't surprise me. Now, why do I say that? You have to realize that how a change in the world happens. A change in the world does not come from like, a president of a country saying, oh, we're gonna change. That is not how real change happens. That's what you think you do, but it's not. A change happens when one of you has the guts to change. 
And so, in this case, Eric and the other group and the other just said, like, hey, we're going to start this company. And so, we're right now six, seven years later, and suddenly we look at this company, 600 people, we go, like, I got to tell you, Florianopolis has changed because of RD. It is changing what is happening locally. Two, three years from now, several of you leaders will have your own startups and start here in Florianopolis. That's where you grow. That means that RD is changing the city and potentially the region. Now, if you change the city and you change the region, it's a very small step to change the country. And you can go like, oh, he's full of it. Well, don't you think that Uber is changing the world? Don't you think that, that um, Netflix is making changes in the world? Don't you think that, that, that Facebook is changing the world? Of course you can change the world. But these folks cannot do it alone. And you think like, oh, it's them. No, the big secret of all this, it actually is you who's changing the world. They're just running the company, they came up with the idea, but you're the one who's changing this. Once you realize this, like, oh my God, I have this incredible opportunity. Then you become from an employee at the company to a leader at the company. The big thing that you have to understand, leadership is not a function of hierarchy. To be a leader in this company, you do not have to have a title. You do not have to be a director or a vice president. What all of them are waiting for is for you to act and behave as leaders among you, and they will give you the reign. They will tell, go ahead. Go ahead. They already are that like. Everybody's waiting for like, who wants to be the leader? Not because it's more money, not because they are going to get a career out of it, just because it's the right thing to do. Now, leader you can be on all kinds of different things. Person can be a leader on writing an email. Person can be a leader on organizing, you know, like social activities. Leadership come in all forms and shapes. That's what I'm trying to let you know. This company can change the country of Brazil. It can. It's going to come from you. And all you need to do is dare to step forward and take on a small task that you really are strong about, that you really feel strong about. Change that, make that better. This company does that better. Four, five, six of you will start making that better. And the company and the country moves forward an inch every day, a centimeter every day. But it will move. And like ice, when it starts melting, in the beginning it melts slowly, slowly. And suddenly you feel like it turns into water. That is what you will see too. It's going to come from you. These folks here, and Eric, and the executive team, and the founder team, cannot melt the ice. They're not strong enough. It needs to come from you. <laughs> Super great. Okay. Thank you. I, I don't want to ask any more questions because I want to stay with this. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me, really quick. Yes. Uh, and maybe after the uh, Rodrigo's question, I don't know. But uh, you've been here since Wednesday. So I'm very eager to hear uh, your key takeaways, if you could share with these people. But uh, oh, maybe you ask the question if it makes sense to answer now, so he can maybe okay. think about the key no, takeaways. I was thinking, but I, uh, I would like to, to also uh, have a, a, an answer on the tough topic, like what do you see that uh, we need to change? Or what do you think that we can improve? Yeah. So what I think that I see a couple of things, and uh, one thing that I really see that you, you need to change, and it's similar to any other company, it's not that you're unique in this. What you have created, you've created little tribes inside departments, and these tribes are not communicating with each other. Now, what everybody's waiting is for you guys to start tell them that they need to communicate with each other. But we can't have that, right? Yesterday when I see sales and customer success, I feel that there's a barrier between the two. I feel like this is the first time that these companies, are, that these two groups are talking to each other in a room. That's not right, right? You don't build a city by having like an individual tribe and with a big wall around it. So you have to learn, like any other organization, how to talk to each other and how to, to, to bond. The great thing is when you do that, you'll see that the workload actually goes down. Because if you start working together, you know, the, the load is shared, but a lot of redundancies are being removed. If you already do that, then I don't have to do it anymore. But that means that we need to remove the tribes. We need to remove the walls between the companies. Now, where we're going to help you with that is normally companies and tools create these barriers. For example, if the customer success managers are sitting on a customer success tool, and the salespeople sitting on the CRM, and the marketing people sit on the marketing automation system, 
then they all stay within their own ecosystem, right? Marketing automation system delivers MQL. The CRM turns MQLs into commits. And then, you know, the, the, the uh, customer success solution turns commits into recurring revenue. Everybody sits in their world with their tool and their organization. We're going to go like, no, 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 no. You have to understand that when you buy a tool, it's like you're starting a restaurant. If you start a restaurant and you want to start, you know, like you, you don't say, I just want to start a restaurant. You say, it's like, no, I want to start an Italian restaurant. When you start a restaurant, you don't start interviewing cooks and then determine, based on the kind of cook, which restaurant you're going to become. You're going to say, no, I'm going to become an Italian restaurant and you hire the best Italian cook. What we're going to try to do with this company, or what we're doing, we don't try. What we're doing is we're saying is like all these tools need to sit on what we call the impact framework. And from one department to talk to the other department, you talk in the terminology of how does this impact the customer? So now your CRM, your marketing automation system, your customer success management solution, all sit on that. So when you talk to each other, you have a common language. You can talk to each other about how does this impact the customer? And we're going to measure that in data. So no longer is it, yes, but my Salesforce <coughs> doesn't work with my customer success managed solution. And, you know, like that's secondary. That will follow your behavior. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why we're trying to say, like, forget which, which co cook you're going to hire. First determine which restaurant you're going to become. The restaurant you're becoming, the company you are, customer centric, and the primary thing that we're going to talk about how does this impact the customer? Awesome. Give me another tough question. Come on! Yay. E só para complementar o que o Iago está falando, é, esse impacto que a gente vê no cliente, a gente precisa compartilhar entre todo mundo da, da empresa. Porque senão, se ficar só comigo, eu vou saber qual é o impacto que eu tenho no cliente ou num segmento específico. Se eu simplesmente compartilhar isso, tudo que deu certo, que eu fiz com um cliente, para todo mundo poder fazer da mesma forma com outro cliente, a gente também encurta o tempo e facilita isso acontecer para todas as, as pessoas da empresa. Outra coisa importante, a gente fala muito sobre o sucesso. A gente também tem que compartilhar o fracasso. Porque se a gente não compartilha o que deu errado, outras pessoas vão errar também e vão gastar o tempo que a gente pode economizar entre todos. Então, esse compartilhamento de informações entre todas as áreas, é o que ele está falando dos silos, né, que a gente está compartilhando... É, é... Exato. É, obrigada. É, a gente precisa tirar essas paredes para que todo mundo possa compartilhar esse conhecimento e isso permeie toda a organização e todo mundo se beneficie com isso. É isso que a gente está tentando mostrar para vocês. Compartilhem o que deu certo. Compartilhem o que deu errado para que todo mundo possa crescer junto. Now, the reason I say this and, and to hook into as much as I could understand from you, think about this. How many companies in the world are doing what you're already doing and then are going and have set a course for where you've set course? How many? 1% maybe, maybe less, zero, zero is going to be significantly less. That makes you the market leader. That is going to turn you into a leader in the world. That is what the unique thing is. This impact framework, customer centric, you know, all this, this is essentially putting you in certain ways ahead of the companies the hip companies like a Google. I don't want you to follow what I said in the Bay Area. I want you to go ahead. You're already there. Now let's move ahead. Because these companies have a hard time moving forward from here because they're too big. You're still maneuverable. We still can have a podcast of 600 people on the live <coughs> broadcast, right? So we can still make that change. But right. I still want to say more in a second. I'm, in the, I'm, yeah. I'm ready. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll get there really quick. Uh, just have a quick question for here because I think it's important. Portuguese. In Portuguese, is that fine? Go for it. No, 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 é, como estando 20 anos em vendas, o que, que acontece? Eu fiz, vocês podem imaginar quantos treinamentos eu fiz na minha vida, né? E todos os treinamentos, quando eu chegava no treinamento, o que, que acontecia? Eu chegava lá, sentava, como vocês estão aqui, e fica ouvindo, e senta e ouve. E ouve mais um pouco, e ouve mais um pouco, aí você sai quadrada daquela sala, né? E fala, como é que eu implemento isso? O que, que eu vou fazer? Eu não sei. Agora, né? Pega o caderno e fica lá fazendo sozinho. 
o grande, a grande sacada, eu acho, do que a gente está fazendo, quem já ouviu falar na metodologia 702? Levanta a mão, por favor. Então, quem não ouviu falar, depois a gente vai compartilhar isso com vocês, é uma das primeiras coisas que a gente fala. O que significa essa metodologia? 10% do que a gente aprende, a gente aprende em sala de aula. A gente falando para vocês, professor, lá na frente. 20% vocês aprendem fazendo entre vocês em pares. E é o que a gente chama de role play. Quem já praticou role play aqui? Levanta a mão. Praticamente todo mundo, certo? Então, o que é o role play? É quando eu aprendo uma coisa e vou testar com o meu colega, meu amiguinho, a pessoa que está do meu lado, para ver se dá certo. Porque se a gente não faz entre nós, com quem a gente vai fazer? Com o cliente. E se a gente não testar antes, será que vai dar certo? Então, a gente tem que testar antes. E 70% é quando a gente implementa e mostra para os outros aquilo que a gente está fazendo, está dando certo, e eu vou ensinar outras pessoas, e eu absorvo ainda mais. Essa é a metodologia que a gente pratica. Então, quando a gente treina, quando a gente faz role play, o que, que acontece? A gente absorve esse conhecimento. Não adianta só eu ficar falando para vocês e vocês não botarem em prática. A gente precisa ver se vai dar certo. Eu preciso testar, eu preciso fazer. Ontem você teve um... Levanta a mão. Como foi o roleplay ontem? Exatamente. Foi muito bom. O que, que aconteceu ontem? Você, você já, já tinha feito quantos treinamentos com a gente? Ah, Alguns. Né? Desde 2017. Isso. Com o Dan, a primeira vez que a gente veio para cá. Exato. O que, que aconteceu? Ele internalizou aquilo faz um tempão que a gente não tinha se falado novamente. Sim. Ele fez exatamente o que a gente fez a primeira vez. Então é isso. O que fica desse treinamento? Não adianta a gente fazer um treinamento com vocês e vocês amanhã esquecerem, certo? Porque ninguém vai absorver nada. Então vocês precisam praticar, vocês precisam praticar entre vocês para que cada vez vocês fiquem melhores, certo? Porque é isso que a gente está buscando, a excelência de vocês. Isso tem que ficar no sangue. Quando você acorda de manhã, eu quero fazer um play, eu quero testar com alguém, eu quero ver se isso vai dar certo. É isso que a gente está buscando. Essa paixão que eu vi na Wayne Design, que eu falei, é isso! Quanto tempo? Por que todo esse tempo até eu chegar nisso? Então é isso que a gente está tentando compartilhar com vocês, um pouco dessa paixão que a gente quer, esse brilho nos olhos é o que a gente quer que vocês passem para os clientes de vocês, porque é isso que eles precisam. No dia a dia ele está lá, infeliz às vezes, né? triste, a gente vai chegar com uma luz para o nosso cliente, eu vou ensinar ele a ser muito melhor. É isso que a gente busca no nosso dia a dia, e é isso um pouquinho que a gente está compartilhando com vocês e tentando fazer com que vocês busquem isso também para a vida de vocês. Obrigada, Rita. What it does, as I follow as much as I could, <laughs> what it does is normally in a training culture, the trainer is the hero. The trainer is the one who knows everything. In the way how we pursue training with you, you're the hero. You're the person that the story is about, not the trainer. <coughs> we reverse it. As a result, we hope that you will make it better. We never think what we say is 100% accurate and the only way to do it. You want to change it? Do it. Then tell me back. Did it work? Did it work better? Did it work less? Then if we so, we adopt it. We move forward. Nobody knows exactly how sales will be five years from now. <coughs> so we all have to get there together. You're the hero of the story. Not Renata, certainly not me, and not anybody else on our team. You're the hero of this story. Changing subject a little bit. You mentioned sometimes during the uh, 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 during the talk, the uh, opportunity uh, that we will collectively share uh, on enabling ourselves uh, and developing our careers. Uh, we are living uh, a, a scale-up moment uh, uh, in our career lives. How do you, I, I'm not sure if the question is actually, but uh, you're feel, feel free to kind of uh, go the way you think it's more appropriate. If it's this transition from startup to scale-up, Uh, how do you see this? Or who, as an individual, how do I make, take the most advantage of working at RD at this moment? Yeah, the, the simple answer is knowledge. And so like what I've learned is that uh, what I found working at, at a company called Skystream, um, I worked there for seven years. I, as a head of sales, you know, like, uh, I was responsible for 69% with my team, a team of about six to eight account executives. Um, I was responsible for 69% of the lifetime revenue of that company. Who's counting? I know, I counted it. 69% of the lifetime revenue of that company came from me. When the company went public, or when I was acquired in the double acquisition, um, 
they didn't promote me at the point in time they were supposed to promote me, which we had agreed to. And they said, why don't we wait with your promotion for three months? And I go like, well, I've been waiting for it for seven years. What does three months make a difference? What did I know? The difference was that they already had agreed or were in preliminary scale of the acquisition. Had I been promoted on January 1st, as promised, I would have received between one and $1.5 million in cash payout. Taxes need to be paid on that, 1.5. Because they delayed it by three months, I got $80,000 out of that. The other executives on the team, some were only six months with the company, got three quarters and up to a million dollars out of payout. I don't have a problem that the CEO took X million dollars. I don't. He earned it and he deserved it. But for me to work seven years at that company, do all this work and only get paid $80,000 while we created actually the value of the company, I was so upset about, emotionally upset. Now there's two things I can do. I can say, screw it. I no longer working for it. I took my CEO to a lunch and he said to me, it used to be living in the Bay Area, you know, it's a dog eat dog world. Can I get angry at him? Of course I can. Is it gonna make any difference? No, he's not gonna just suddenly write a check for one point, what, X million dollars, right? It's not gonna happen. Here's the problem that this cost. I was so focused on that money and I was so upset about it that I forgot what it actually did for me. And what it did for me is, uh, per today, if you ask me, what is your email address? I still say every now and then, Jocko at Skystream. No, it's not Skystream anymore, it's winning by design. But in the, I always would use that. That work that I did at that company left such an impression on me, and I learned so much, that as the outcome of that, I forgot about all that because I was focused on the money. And what my CEO and with the VC later on, actually, they never told me what I realized. If the number one thing that you get out of this experience, whether it's be startup, grow up, scale up, whatever it is, is an incredible amount of knowledge and an extremely powerful network. Here's what I want you to think about. What I didn't know, that Skystream was it for me. That was the big moment in my career. I didn't realize that. It took me like another 10, 20 years sitting in front of people like you to go like, man, actually that was a really cool experience. You don't like, I'm not gonna give you that excuse. You are not gonna have that experience that I had. I'm gonna tell you, this is the one. You cannot tell me, RD being one of the top startups in the country, that this is not one of the best jobs to have. Not if you look at money or essentially some of the headaches. You're gonna have lack, money, lack of money and headaches everywhere. You're gonna have them everywhere. What you gotta look around is like, these people all around you, there will be five CEOs of brand new, very successful companies in this audience of 600 people that you have right here, right now. They're here. If you go outside, you still gotta go look for them. There will be people that will become your best friends in this group right here. You are, as a group, you experienced what I've experienced. I've attended weddings, funerals, the VPs of sales that I worked for, their kids now are interning at our company. This is a close-knit part that you're of. Do not figure that out after you're gone. Realize it now and act upon it now and start sharing knowledge and best practices. Don't wait for them to set up a study group at night to learn something from each other. Learn now. The groups that you build are very similar to what you did in college. In college, you had a very cool social lifestyle and you bonded with people. Under the duress of extreme growth and structure and pain that you're experiencing, some of the tightest relationships are being built. Think about that as you are, and don't get away from this company realizing I missed that opportunity. I did that, and I, and I don't want to ha have you do that, okay? Take that opportunity to learn from each other right now. This company will not pay necessarily in the money, they will pay in this extraordinary network of people that are all around you, being one of the leaders of the world. I can tell you, you've already seen it, if you go and you go too premature and you're here for nine months and you go to another company, they, will tell, they won't st say like, oh, you know, can we discuss what you do? They go like, SQLs is what I needed. MRR is what I need. Onboarding is what I need. Teach us what, you taught, what they taught you at, at RD. Then, six months into the job, it's the same shit everywhere. I can tell, I, mean, I promise you, do not think that anywhere else is gonna be better or worse. It's exactly the same, whether you're a grow up, scale up, startup, all very the same. 
Now, I want to ask them a question. Can I ask them a question? Sure. Okay. Oops. Yeah. Don't move. I can take the mic. Oh, yeah, please. Sure. Who of you want to ask a question? Because this is all honest and sincere, but you got to test me. <laughs> yeah. Who wants to role play with John? <laughs> there you go. Ask a question. Thank you. You know you're an angel, right? Mm -hmm. I already keep telling you, you're an angel. Uh, how do you see uh, this, these different moments as a professional in different contexts? Because the skills and the behavior you need in a startup are different from scale-up and they're different from a big corporate uh, company. How do you see yourself as a professional evolving not to be you know, uh, outgrown by, by the company? Yes. Okay. It's a, it's a, there's, there's two things, there's two quotes, and you'll see them commonly because we use them often. And Nancy Duarte's quote is one that, that you know, like is really always stuck in my mind. She's a good friend and she taught me this. The future, whether it's a startup or scale up, is not a place that you get to go. You got to realize it's not a place you get a ticket to and say, oh, I'm going to get in a train to the place to the future. It's not. You got to realize that the future is a place you get to create. Quote Nancy Duarte, right? That is, you get to create it. Everything else, all this, whether it's a scale up or a startup, all that BS, the same, not BS, but all that structure is there to, to is, it's a corporate structure. It's not an identity change. It's not. Second quote is from Marianne Williamson. And I can't quote it because it's a very long quote exactly. But it's, what it says to me, it's written on my mirror. It, I am more afraid of being successful than you're actually afraid of failing. You have to realize that. Most people are afraid of success more than being successful. Now, what I'm looking at in general inside people, I go like, you know what? That person, Renata, maybe nobody believes her, but my gosh, she's going to be awesome at something, right? Or Roberto, I see what the potential is in someone. What you find, the difference between a, a scale-up, a grow-up, and a startup, at the scale-up, early on at the startup. So early on at the startup, everybody's a believer and we can do this. Everybody is like gung-ho and not afraid and well, let's go do this. At the, as you start to scale up, you go like, okay, well, my career is at stake. And by the time you get at the grow up, all the fear is gone of success and everybody goes like, dude, I just want to have my job. I want to have a 95. You're right still in the cool factor. You're right still there. Within two years, you have moved as a company out of that mode. That means, that you gotta do two things. The future is a place you get to create. And you can't be afraid of it that you fail in the process. You can't. Now, some of you have to realize the following. When we ask you to lead, you will fail. You will. I hope so. And the role of management is when you fail, is to correct you. We call it a slip, a slap on the hand, right? Uh, a slip on the wrist. When they correct you, that's not a negative thing. Oh, it's a dent on my career. I just got corrected. No. You took three steps forward. That was a little bit too fast. Take one step back. You're cool? Oh, cool. That's a hand slap, right? It's a negative way of describing it. But you will be corrected. That is okay. I'd rather have you slightly corrected backwards and make sure, okay, don't go too fast for everybody else. Then you're sitting in a seat waiting for somebody else to do so. People in your group, I want you to make mistakes. Do not burn the company, right? <laughs> <laughs> make Pro appropriate risks when you do something, but take risks. The rewards in your stage are significantly bigger than the risks you're taking. If you're a company like Adobe and somebody goes on LinkedIn and says something very foolish, you know, like very whatever, discriminatory or something like that, that will hurt a company with a big brand name way more. But when you're like this, the risks are, s are smaller, but the rewards are so much bigger. Next question. Go for it. As I understood, you are going to execute a big change on our way of doing our work. Uh, do you have any idea about what will be the most uh, challenge on our changes? Like. Uh, what will be the most blocker that commonly you face when you try this? Yeah. The change is not, you know, I'm going to say to you, the change is not, the change is, the, is the, the, the size of the step that you make over time. For example, if I want you to make a gigantic step by tomorrow, then the change is big. Most sales kickoffs work like that. They want to give you a two-day sales training and they want to change your entire behavior. 
So taking that is a big step and therefore it often fails. What we're looking at when we implement a change, we don't think that the steps are too big. We make very small steps, but we take them in quick succession. And so as a result, the smaller step is easier to digest for you and it's easier to implement. But because we take so many, pretty soon you will look back and you go like, look how far I have come. It's like hiking up a mountain. Look how far I've come. When you hike up the mountain, you constantly see the mountain in front of you. And then at every point in time when you stop, you take a sip of water, you look around, oh my gosh, I'm already taller than that building. That is what proper change in a, in a company should do. You're hiking up that hill, you see the big thing in front of you, but every now and then you look back, you go like, my gosh, I'm so high. The biggest challenge we face is the following. It's not them, it's the middle managers. Who of you is a manager of a group of people? Right? So it's one in 10 approximately. These are the people that have the toughest jobs because the ability to digest and to implement inside the company, what we are all agreeing, sits in their hand. Not by them being a hierarchical manager and with a whip say, you shall do this. <coughs> that won't work. What they have to do is they, become, have to, they have to become coaches and enablers to help you to do what we are showing you with instructional videos and role play videos and, and all visual enablement. What we are showing you to do, they have to step back and say like, let you do it. And then you gotta do it. If you won't do it, it won't happen. By the way, we still get paid, <laughs> right? <laughs> So, yo, like, do we, by the way? <laughs> Wanna talk about this? <laughs> <laughs> Just like, I, I'm, I'm trying to think. <laughs> but we need you to implement it, right? It's really important. And so, now, if you come back and say it won't work, then let's adjust it. That's a good feedback. Good feedback, it doesn't work. Bad feedback is, I didn't try it, mm -hmm. right? And so our biggest thing is have the middle managers don't become hierarchical management, managers and enable you in a, what we call the flipped classroom, as Renata said a second ago in Portuguese, have that enable you to do it so that you start learning from each other. Last question? Yeah, I think it's the last question. Can I have a, an uh, opposite gender question? And I know I've seen my girls around the whole day, or I see the women around the whole day, and they've been asking me incredibly tough questions. So, and I see one that I'm looking at right now over there. Yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> good, good choice. Good, right? Yeah, this, you had tough questions yesterday for me. Yes, I, <laughs> you have already asked my questions yesterday. But. Repeat what you asked, feel free. I'll be after the group. Yes. As a manager, how I, I agree with you that that can be the most difficult with all this process. And which how can we tell us and tell the rest of the group to make this this manager this merge between the managers and the peers and how can we can share this culture so they can be ownership to do their role plays by themselves for example the role of management is changing we see this with kids in classrooms that teachers are no longer the bearer of all the knowledge. They, the teachers are the enabler of a classroom. So the role of managers inside, your role as a manager is changing. You're not the hierarchical boss. You're not the one of sort of all the knowledge. So too is the role of the people changing. The role of the people are changing because they are essentially are more and more in charge. If you ask today's founders and CEOs, what are they more fearful of? A meeting with the board, their board, or a meeting of seeing that there are people leaving. Many are fearful. The most thing that they're feared of is their key, all their people leaving. This is because of that misunderstanding what management is about. Meaning that your employees, the people that work for this company, are often more powerful than they think they are. The manager has to turn that power that they have into knowledge. That knowledge that needs to be shared by the group so they can all benefit from it and they start enabling each other. That means that the role of the manager is that of an enabler. 
and not that of the hierarchical manager. It's the manager more, we, we call it coach versus trainer. Trainer tells you how to do many push-ups and a coach tells you what you can benefit from with those push-ups and why you should consider doing those push-ups, right? So we see these two things. In order to do that, well, we have a program for it that we enable you folks. So we have a training, you know, like uh, Paula will create a video for you that where here's how you train or how you coach this. There will be a board, there will be a card. Here's how you help your team enable. Dang, that was a good dang. Yeah. <laughs> and so, I hope nobody heads hurt. And so, so what you want to make sure is that as a, as a manager, you become more of an enabler and less of a person who looks into uh, promotion, uh, your career changes, and stuff like that. Over the, in the future, I believe that, that more and more of that will go to HR, and you as managers will have less insight in what each individual is paid into your, into your group. That's just not part of your world. Your world is, as a coach, do I get the best out of this person? Are they aligned with the, the interest of the group? Okay. Now, final thoughts? Yes, final thoughts before. Look, what you're going to see and what you have seen us do is like, why does this all need to be with, you know, like, with only a little fun? And so, as you always know, and whether it's me popping Red Bulls or standing on stage or dancing or something like that, I believe it's like, look, this was all good and well, but can we please make selling and working also fun? And not fun that is staged kind of fun, like, oh, applaud, you know, like, oh, it's exciting, right? Yeah, <laughs> let's take a selfie, ah, I'm back off, right? You know, like, no. So I don't believe that that's how, you know, fun cannot be created. Fun needs to be coming from you. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna interject as much as we can these sessions of training with music, with things that you want to do. We love to see where you do cool, you know, like setups where you're laughing and you're having fun and when you're enjoying it. Let's put that back. When you give that back to us, we're turning that back into videos with putting on cool DJ music. So when you see yourself back, you go, like, yeah, that was fun, okay? Here's the reason why I say this. Your glass, have you heard of the saying, the glass is half full and half empty? Yeah. Your glass ain't half full, people. It's the thing that people tell you about your glass being half full is hurting you. Because when you think it's half full, the first thing you think of, but it's also half empty. It ain't half empty. I'll give you a simple example. In your world, how many of you and how many times do you think of the worst case scenario what could happen right now? The electricity could go out when you're standing at a car or standing at a stoplight. This could happen. Most people think about the worst case scenario, I could get killed, this could go totally wrong, fired today, twice a day. That means that most people think about, most of you think about worst case scenario 500 to 1,000 times a year. How many times does actually the worst case scenario happen? How many times? Well, once? The death just death? once. Yeah, the death just <laughs> once. <laughs> or a, a death of your, your parent or your son, or, or, or for a family member, right? But it happens, it happens very rarely. Now, when it happened, did you really, were you really able to change it? And my counsel in general is no. It was going to happen anyway. Maybe not this time, but maybe next time, right? So we don't have to worry about the worst case scenario. We just forget about it. You can already see that the times that it actually happens is meaningless. So don't worry about it. Now, I challenge you the following. How many times when you think about something positive, when you act something positive, when you laugh, uh, when I check out early at the, at the hotel, and when I check out early and I'm having fun with the person behind the desk, she, uh, and she asks her manager for approval, do, do I pay because I check out early? Does he have to pay a penalty fee? <laughs> and the manager goes like, no. How many times do you think if you're positive and help your peer, the person next to you, do you think it positively impacts you? I can tell you a lot. You get upgraded on flights, you get free hotel rooms, you get cab drivers that laugh at you and smile at you, you get people hugging and cheering. All the times that you do something positive, it actually does make an impact. So negative thinking, little impact. Positive thinking, huge impact, right? Now I go back to the glass being half full. Your glass ain't half full. Your glass is 99, for most of you, it's 99% full. And because everybody thinks it's half full, they think of it's half empty, and look how much I gotta fill. No, 
is 99% full. Enjoy how full it is. Every now and then I go to bed and look at Maureen, um, who is my wife for the past, or he's my partner for 31 years and my wife for over 20 years. And I go like, do you have a toothache? And you go like, I don't have a toothache. I don't have a toothache either. Toothache, right? Yeah. And I go like, because I know how shitty it is if you have a toothache and you go to bed. And I don't want to be thinking when I have a toothache in bed, I'm like, oh, yesterday was so great when I have I go like, every day, I'm like, I don't have a toothache. This is a great day, right? <laughs> <laughs> the glass is full, 99%. That leads me to that. That means that you can think positive. Then you work at an incredible company that you know, like has all their issues and aches and problems. And then I tell you, you go fix it. Help us. And if you can't fix it, then engage these people. Then they will help you fix it. Then make this the place that you want your children to work one day. Make this the place that is going to change, continue to change Florianopolis, change the region, and essentially change the country. And the world. And with that, the world. And then I go like, oh, is that too big to dream? Hell yeah, that's too big to dream. Consider it a plan, not a dream. And I forgot who, who said it to me last night, who sent it to me in an Instagram message. If it's a dream, let's make it a plan, right? And we do that, and then we're gonna fail. Oh, you know what? I died early because I failed to change the world. Well, that I can live with. Mm -hmm. I don't have a problem with living with that, right? So, with that said, and what I want you to do is we have created some songs for you. We have created in a second, they're gonna pull it up, and we created an, you know, like a clip. And that clip is getting louder. And what this clip signals, what we wanna show you with that song, is your voice that only counts. The voice that you have and the louder it gets will change, will instigate the change, so that's one. And the second video we have that we've also put on you is, it's called, a, it's a mixed by DJ Back. She's a, you know, one of the fastest growing DJs over in Europe. She created this, this female. female DJs. And she created this track for us, especially for us. She created, this is not like, oh, it must have, he says this to everybody, no. I walked off stage at RD, RD Summit. I go like, and you saw what happened. I go like, this is amazing, mm -hmm. right? And I go like, this is not normal. And I realized that the song choice had a lot to do with it. And so we then asked the DJ to create this song for us. They asked me to speak for a minute, she then interlaced that for, it's really odd when you hear yourself talking to a song, but you can later on be the judge of that. <laughs> but that's what you, yeah, what you can do. That has been Slack to your channel. Consider that what you started. But what we have here, what we're gonna uh, pull up in a second, is your song, and that song is called Getting Louder. And what we want you to realize is your voice is not only heard, it's gonna change your group, this company, the region, the country, and if you do it right, it will change the world. Let's get louder. Let's Thank get you. louder. <laughs> I cannot do the, you know. Well, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> As they, you know, like, figure it out. Um, I want you to make sure you realize, um, or if you can, please sign up for our YouTube channel. You know, subscribe to it. It's public. We're pushing more and more content out. Sign up for that. We want to make sure that you get the latest uh, uh, noise. What is this? What are we having here? <laughs> I guess somebody actually, yeah, there we go. Now, in this channel, what you're gonna see is we have also under Winning by Design, we have a cool asset with all the cool videos, clips that we're gonna, gonna join. That's Epic Promos. Under the Epic Promo, <laughs> the other one, the other one, yes. That's the song, that was me laughing. People think that I'm you know, like nuts. Okay, with that said, thank you very much for having us. Congratulations on what you've done. Have a wonderful time and let's get louder. <laughs> Yes, the six minutes. Oh, yeah, okay. uh.